This is the DRF Players Podcast. Here are your hosts, Peter Thomas Fornatel and Jonathan Kinchin. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. This is show 361, the August 24th, 2018 edition. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal, back with you. Going to be heading back up to the spa in short order once the show is concluded. But I am still in uh, my mom's garage on beautiful uh, Long Island, New York, joined today by two very special guests. Before I introduce them, I'm going to thank today's sponsor. Once again, honored to be sponsored by the New York Racing Association for this special Saratoga Travers Day preview show. Going to be going in-depth on the graded stakes races happening on tomorrow's card. Can't wait to get back up there and be betting with both fists as horse players around the country will be doing truly special Travers card on offer that we'll be diving into. And we're going to bring in a couple of special guests who've been on the show before to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first one of those guests. He is the director of Bloodstock, as well as the assistant racing manager for a little operation called Windstar. He's been on the show before, a horse player as well, and fine handicapper in his own right, Sean Tugel. Sean, how are you doing today? Great, Pete. Uh, appreciate the invitation to come back on to the uh, podcast. It's not like you have anything else going on these days, so we, we, we definitely appreciate you, uh, you, you finding, finding a few minutes. And rounding out our trifecta, oh, you go ahead, Sean. No, I'll just say it's a, it's a little bit slower than it was a couple months ago. But it's still, <laughs> still plenty busy. We're, we're going to get a little bit into what your 2018 has been like, Sean, if we have time after rolling through some of these stakes races. We might have to have you on for a whole other appearance to uh, talk about the ride that Justify took you and the rest of the Windstar crew on throughout 2018. But but we have so much racing to get to. We're going to start there. And the next step along the way is to bring in another return guest. Last heard on this very show, the day before the Travers show in 2017, when he gave out a bunch of winners um, and proceeded to hit the pick six the following day. He's a man who goes by many names and has many different uh, accolades uh, among his. Uh, sorry, we have uh, somebody else's cell phone here in mom's garage. We're going to put that right in the drawer and not worry about it anymore. Um, <laughs> goes by many names. He is the Sultan of Schenectady. He is the Piper at the Gates of Dawn. He is the Mad Piper. He is horse player, jockey agent to the stars, Chris Pippito Pipes. Pipes, how are you doing today? What's up, Big P? Everything is good, buddy. Everything is good. You, you chose a good day to have me on. We got pipes right off the rip in the first race today. <laughs> I do. I did want to ask you if that horse pipes was was named after you. I also wanted to point out to the listeners that you, you know you may be the only one in the world to do a PTF impression, but you definitely do the best PTF impression. Maybe we can look forward to hearing that at some point during today's show. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they named that horse after me. You know, you'd have to talk to Cock Campbell and the boys, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and also today not joined live like sean and pipes but we do have we're going to have several guest appearances from our normal co-host jonathan kinchin jk he is not on the planet texas today he is actually phoning it in from old blight he's over in the uk checking out one of his brother MK's shows, but he was kind enough to make a few recordings for us and has sent those along. And producer Craig will be uh, playing them periodically, starting with some opening remarks from our man, Jonathan Kinchin. What's up, fellas? Uh, I miss you guys. I wish I was there. Tugel, you don't ever come hang out with us in the secret spot, but that's okay. I still love you. Pipes, if you're betting with one, you got one ticket. You walk up to the window, you got one ticket. You're wrong, my man. More tickets, more tickets. Uh, you know, look here, and Pete, I need to tell you this, okay? I've been asking around here, and, and everyone seems to believe that that can't be asked. A S K E D oh makes God. a lot more sense. Like, I can't be bothered. I cannot be asked the question. So I don't care what the history of, of of the British people have come up with. I feel like can't be asked makes a lot more sense. And uh, these these people that I'm sitting next to in the pub at the moment agree with me on that. So I, I don't care what you think. Uh, uh, excited to be here and, and sort of and, and hope you guys have a fun show. Oh, my goodness. We'll leave uh, JK and his uh, 
his linguistic discussions aside, the less said about those, the better. And let's dive right in to the races on this card. I wasn't going to make you guys talk about the undercard at all. I was just going to go right in to the Jerkins, which goes as race six. But I will give this opportunity, uh, Pipes, it seemed like you had something to say about your namesake horse running, or if you guys have any other spot you want to talk about in the undercard, now's a good time. And it's also cool if you just sort of rubber stamp my decision to go ahead and start with the graded stakes. But starting with you, Pipes, anything you're excited about betting on this undercard? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, I like the angle hard horse in the first race tomorrow that put the glass down. I really like that nitrous race. I thought the horse ran really professional first time out. I was waiting to bet the horse back. And, you know, he shows up in a race against uh, this Gray's Creek for Chad, this pioneer from the rail. So, I don't know. That horse might might be a monster. But, uh, yeah, I, I was I was interested in, you know, using that Engelhart horse as a single in the first race, trying to get lucky maybe in the pick five. All right. I know you're a big believer in those serial bets. I've seen you have some success this meet, uh, taking down those pick fives. Maybe you can get the day started off right. Sean, how about you? Anything on the undercard before we dive into the stakes portion of the program? No, just a quick, I think we have two horses ourselves running on the undercard. We actually have one in the first there as well. Um, the horse starting point for Mott picks up Jose Ortiz. Um, he's cutting back a furlong to where he, you know, he had the lead at the eighth pole. So um, he's sitting there at six to one. I think he's going to run back and, and show very well. And then we also have a horse in the uh, the fourth race there, um, horse that we you know we we got one race into him and, and we we think he's a turf horse to begin with, so he's making his first start on the turf, and uh, we should we should see a little bit of an improved performance there as well with Jose Ortiz back on that horse. All right, a couple little couple little pushes there, a couple little updates on how the Wind Star contingent is doing on the undercard, and that leads us right into our discussion of race six. Grade one for three-year-olds going seven furlongs. Sean, we'll start with you. Um, I'm just going to ask a very simple question about it. Is this a two-horse race between Promises Fulfilled and Forensic Fire, or do you see it as, as more open, and where did you land? Well, I, I, on paper, I would have to agree that it's definitely a two-horse race. Uh, with the third horse, who I think has a shot as well, still having fun. I think he's a, a horse that uh, is still probably uh, has has a has a career best number to to still attain. A uh, horse that's been very competitive throughout the spring, and uh, last time the Woody Stevens I thought was ran a very nice race. If he takes another step forward at, at six at seven to one or six to one, I'm sorry. Um, I think he's a horse you definitely have to use. My horse is Farine Fire. Um, I think he's one of the best three year olds, if not the best three year old, around one turn. I think it's exactly what he wants to do. Um, Jason Service is on fire in New York, and, and uh, you know, that would be my A horse coming in, in that race for sure for, for me. But still having fun underneath. Piper, I know you have a history with the trainer of number seven, still having fun, Tim Keefe, from your uh, jockey agent days. How, how serious of a chance do you think this one has here in the Jerkins? Piper, did we lose you? Producer Craig, not sure what's going on with Pipes. I'm sure we'll get him back on in a minute. Um, meanwhile, um, let's go ahead while we try to find Pipes and play Jonathan Kinchin's thoughts on this race, if we can, uh, if we can do that. And then afterwards, we'll reconnect with uh, we'll reconnect with Pipes. Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's that was a little bit late for that. Look, this is the, the name of the race that I always mispronounce, the Allen H. Jerkins, the Jerkins Allen H., the H. Allen Jerkins, the, the Allen Jerkins, formerly known, the artist formerly known as the King's Bishop. I love promises fulfilled in this spot. He's drawn down on the inside, going to show a ton of early speed as he has in his last two starts around one turn. I think the horse is extremely, diff, you know, going to be difficult to beat in here. He doesn't have a lot of pace to, uh, to, to deal with in this spot as he is, as he has in other spots. Um, I think he's going to be extremely tough in here. If, if for whatever reason, he's his own worst enemy and goes too fast, gets a little bit too carried away, the only other horse I think that can beat him in this spot is Forenze Fire coming from off the pace. Uh, obviously, the Jason Service effect has, has, has been well known in the Naira area. So, I, you know, I think this horse is, is the closer that you want. If for whatever reason you find that there's going to be some other horse 
that can uh, that can that can press promises fulfilled. But for me, I think promises fulfilled is dead loose in here. Uh, I think he'll be able to relax and run a little bit slower than than, than he has in his past two races. I think he's going to be extremely tough. Uh, one horse I will give a small look to, and, and I'd like to have a little penny on, is uh, Gidu, the Frank, the son of Frankel, who, who went over to Ascot and and uh, was kind of a runoff in the uh, uh, in the in the National Museum, the Hall of Fame, and, and, and ran pretty well in that spot. And let's see what he does getting on dirt for the first time, but still could be dangerous, at, at which should be a pretty big price. Guy spends uh, 20 minutes in England, and all of a sudden he's picking Frankel horses to run on the dirt. Uh, <laughs> P- Pipes, I understand you're back. What were your What was your view in this race? I'm back. I, I lost you guys. I didn't hear what these guys had to say, but I my view in the uh, in the I'm going to call it the King's Bishop. You know, I know they call it the <laughs> Alan Jerkins here, but it's always going to be the King's Bishop to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a strong stance with Forenzi Fire. I think this horse is getting back to doing what he's meant to do. I always thought this horse was like a seven eighths to a mile type horse. I understand why they were on the Derby Trail, um, but I think that this horse is just getting back to what he wants to do. And the last performance was explosive. I, you know, this they've been pointing here since that spot. I think there's definitely enough speed to set it up. I think this horse it's a great trip, and I've never been a promises fulfilled guy. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to jump on now. Fair enough. That, that makes sense. We develop relationships with these horses, especially through their three-year-old year and, and beyond. And sometimes you gotta you gotta stick to those guns. So we think that is one we definitely think narrows down. Race seven, the personal ensign used to be run on the Friday. Used to be run today, the day before the Travers. Since they've gone, since Naira's gone to this amazing uh, super card Travers Day format, the sort of Breeders' Cup in the middle of the summer format. It's now run on the undercard, and it's another race that seems to me anyway, uh, and I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure to everybody else, like it really narrows down. Pipes, who are you going to go with in your picks for the personal answer? I'm going to take a late. You know, I mean, I went back and forth on uh, on these two horses, and, you know, I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i splitting hairs. Obviously, they're both champion-type fillies. Um, I, just, I just think a late, uh, second off the bench. I thought a mile and a quarter was a lot to ask of this filly off the bench. I think she just, you know, was a was a powerhouse. I mean, Jose took her back to dead last, kept her in the clear the whole way, circled the field like I mean, you know, he he could have won by twenty lengths if he wanted. Uh, I'm I'm gonna think a late is just the better of these two great fillies, and that's where I'm going to stand. But I'll, I'll be using them both. I don't have any real creativity um, in the race. I mean, I'll use them both, but I'm, I'm picking a late on top. There were those stories also adding to a late appeal that were published in DRF a couple of weeks ago from the excellent uh, clocking work done by the likes of Dave Grenning and Mike Welsh, who, uh, along with Donald Harris, contribute to the DRF Clocker Report. And, and it was pretty interesting how as highly regarded of a workhorse as Hofberg has been at times, um, a late apparently just toying with him and really looking amazing in in uh, in that workout. And certainly she's something to behold when you clap eyes on her, something I imagine uh, Sean Tugels had the opportunity to do once or twice this summer. Sean, is a late your pick in the personal incident as well, or do you think it's uh, uh, you think Abel Tasman, who's actually the morning line favorite, is going to get it done? You know, um, I would be picking a late, um, and and many of those reasons being that I did get to see her train for several weeks in Saratoga. Uh, the video of her breathing against Hofburg I thought was fantastic. Uh, you know, she's come back as a four-year-old and, and put in a, I mean, as Pipe said, coming back and to run a mile and a quarter off the bench, that's, she's dead fit, obviously, so. Uh, she should be able to make another move forward. I'm a little concerned about the pace setup. I think she'll probably get a good uh, stalking trips in off Farrell. Uh, for me, the question is what Mike Smith does with Abel Tasman. Does he go to the lead from the rail? Does he let Farrell go out and get loose? Um, so for me, I, I, I do believe a late would, will be my pick, but uh, I'm having a little bit of a tough time kind of seeing the whole race set up here. But, uh, but maybe you have a better, better understanding of it for me. Well, let's, we'll go to our, uh, our clip. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit further. We'll see if Jonathan Kinchin in the, in the tape he sent along about this race uh, touches this idea at all. But th- there are some interesting potential pace angles with, with two horses uh, from uh, Pipes' man, Luch, in the race. But, but first, let's hear from, uh, let's hear from Jonathan Kinchin. 
you guys won't believe what happened to me. TSA pre-check uh, is, is always great, but I guess when you're traveling internationally, uh, you're, you're subject to a little bit more scrutiny. So they, they went through my bag. Uh, they saw a lot of things. They saw my box of chalk. They saw uh, a lot of things that weren't an issue. But for whatever reason, they weren't happy about the silver wig. So unfortunately, although I'm in London in spirit, the silver wig is not with me. Uh, I texted my boy B squared. Uh, he's not responding to me. The texts keep coming back green. I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, so for that reason, I got to stick with a late here. Uh, Abel Tasman has beat a late in the two times they've run against one another. But for me, I think a late's going to be entirely too tough. I think she's doing too well. Uh, she's been working here. She's been working over this racetrack. And uh, I, I think maybe Abel Tasman can get her in another in another race. But I think for this spot, a late is doing way too good. All right, we have we it's it's like a chorus here with the elate fans out uh, on the podcast today. Let's return to that idea of the pace for a minute. So it does seem logical that the two here could be sent at all costs to maybe try to set it up for the other Luch horse, the three furiously kissed to get a piece. I wonder if that couldn't affect the the race shape as a whole. It certainly might make the riders on uh, on Abel Tasman and the late give them something at least a little bit to think about. Pipes, how do you see the pace uh, shaking out in the personal answer? I mean, if this sheet takes heart, doesn't doesn't dead send? I don't even know what the horse is doing in the race. Then, uh, I mean, that horse is supposed to keep the pace honest up front. You know, Pharrell is going to go. You're going to have you're going to have a decent enough pace. I can see a I could see a 47 and change with no problem, uh, you know, for a late to just lay back and move when she wants to move. I think Schmidt will try to lay third and, and maybe get the jump. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I, I think the pace will be honest enough with Pharrell and then, you know, the other Luch horse in there. I don't think you're going to have a problem with pace. I think there'll be enough. All right, let's move on to our discussion of race eight, the ballerina. Uh, Sean, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Um, who did you come up with in here? I've been a big Ivy Bell fan uh, probably since she was winning back in uh, down there at Gulfstream. Um, I think she's a lot like Perrine's Fire in the previous races where uh, she probably is, is a sprinter, seven furlong, maybe mile or one turn. Um, I'm hoping getting back to that, she can step up her speed figures to, to, to be able to step up and win a race like this. She's sitting at five to one Castellano stays aboard. Um, you know, obviously I give very big respect to Finley's lucky charm and Lewis Bay, but, but I'm going to try the Philly on the cutback and, and hopefully get a price there. It does have that look. Um, I think at first you could you could look at the Chouvet and think, Oh, mm-hmm, maybe is she possibly tailing off? But when you, when you look back at the one turn races, maybe that was just an opportunity to, to take a shot, see what she could do going long. Obviously, uh, previous connections didn't think that was her game. And, and now Todd Pletcher in agreement, maybe getting back to what she does, uh, what she'll want to do best. I guess my one knock on her potentially could be the way the pace scenario shakes out. It does look to me like Finley's lucky charm is potentially loose. And it would seem to me that Erad Ortiz on Lewis Bay might be content to just stalk from second and they'll try to back it down slash run efficiently to the point where it might be hard for uh, for different closers to get involved. But there's a few other very interesting horses in here as well. Pipes, where did you land in uh, in this year's ballerina? Me and Poogle are either going to be walking out with bags of cash or we're going to be tearing up a lot of tickets because I'm on this Ivy Bell too. I, uh, I think, you know what, last time I agree with everything that Sean said. I, I do agree that she's a seven ace type horse. I think last time she still could have won the shoe, but you go back and watch that trip, man. She was in like no man's land in that spot. She basically got left. Then she was trying to chase on wide on a pace that held together. Just nothing set up for her that day, the right way for her to run her a race. And she still only blew two lengths. Now she's getting back to what she wants to do, sitting in behind. I thought the Humana Distaff was a great race in the mud against American Gal. At the eighth pole, I thought she was a dead winner. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to hope that she can sit right in behind the speed and have enough stamina to pick up the pieces late and just be better than these at 7 ace. But um, I've always kind of been married to Lewis Bay a little bit. I've always liked that horse. It's going to be hard for me for her to not be on any of my tickets. Um, I'll probably use her defensively, but I am on Ivy Bell. And I also see 
Uh, I also see Marley's freedom showing more speed tomorrow. I think that I don't think it's as cut and dry as like Finley's lucky charm sets the pace and these others are all on the chase. I expect Marley's freedom to show plenty of pace. Do you think she has a chance to hang around at the end pipes or do you see Marley's freedom as more of a pace factor? Um, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think she's a decent enough Philly. I, I'm not, I don't think that she stacks up when the real running begins with the likes of Lewis Bay or Finley's lucky charm or Ivy, but I think she's just a cup below, but I, I, uh, I definitely think that she can impact the race though on the front end. It's very difficult at this point in time, seeing what Bob Baffert has done in New York on these big days over the last couple of years, very, very difficult to say, oh, this is one I want to oppose. But at the price she'll be, morning line favorite, I'm sure she'll, if, even if she doesn't go the favorite, she's going to take a ton of money. My gut is that Marley's Freedom is one, at least in uh, most of my pick wagers, that I'm going to attempt to oppose the more I look at this race. Sean, is that just nuts? I, I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think you're, you're, you're stepping too far out of the box there. No, right. but I mean, can we can we agree that she's that she's probably likely more to be around seven to two or four to one than to go off post time? You know, the favorite. I mean, I, I'd actually put it. My gas pipes, I put right in the middle of those. I think there's going to be. You've got looking at the daily racing form PPs. You've got the huge speed figure two back, and I just think at this point you can't underestimate. The Baffert factor uh, on a big day such as Travers Day, there's just going to be you have numerical reasons and you have sort of softer reasons with the incredible run of Baffert success in New York on the big days that are both going to push that number down. So favorite might seem a little extreme, but I understand why uh, morning line maker David Aragona, who does a fine job, put her there and, and really nothing would surprise me. Let's see what our man JK has to say about this race. Let me guess the the the, the Piper. He he picked uh, he picked uh, Lewis Bay. Uh, and we're always we always seem to in all these races where where Lewis Bay's running. He, he seems to be on her, and I'm against her. Um, and I, I bet after her last performance, he he picked Lewis Bay. Look for me, like I told you guys in the, in the last segment, uh, my my silver wig is is stuck in in customs over in the U.S. I think Marley's freedom is definitely live. She can definitely run. I'm going to use her in multi-race bets. But I think that she's going to ding-dong with Finley's Lucky Charm. I think Finley's Lucky Charm is live as well. But because I think those two could hook up, I'm not really a believer in Lewis Bay as a, as a closing sprinter, a late-running sprinter. Um, I'm going to land on Ivy Bell. I've been chasing this horse all year long. I, I loved her at Churchill, and, and, and she couldn't get the job done. Loved her at Belmont. She couldn't get the job done against Abel Tasman, uh, going the, the, the one, you know, the one turn ish mile in the 16th. Uh, they tried to stretch her out in the shoe V. She didn't embarrass herself there. Uh, was trying to chase a slow pace, was trying to close into that and just couldn't get there. I think she's an extremely talented horse. And I think that this, uh, the seven furlongs with some pace to run into is going to hit her right between the eyes. She's going to save ground down on the inside. Javier will, will tip her out at the top of the lane and, and I think she'll run down. Uh, one of the two speed horses in Finley's Lucky Charm or Marley's Freedom. I'm very, very excited at an opportunity to bet on Ivy Bell. Well, I'll tell you what, for our group, it really, it really is going to be the penthouse or the outhouse, an amazing amount of agreement in races that we did not discuss beforehand. So we'll, we'll have to see lots of love for Ivy Bell uh, in the ballerina. And it, it seems like the same horses uh, getting, getting discussed back and forth by the panel. We'll all see how it we'll see how it all plays out on Saturday. Um, we're either going to be very alive in the pick sixes, or we're going to be <laughs> reaching back in for these late picks uh, when it comes time for race nine, the for go pipes. I'm going to go right back to you for this one. I, I think I have a feeling I know who JK is going to pick here based on previous podcasts. Uh, I'm curious where you end up um, in the for go. You know, man, I mean, I, I looked over this race for a long time, and I I want so bad to pick Whitmore. I just wish that there was more pace to set it up. I just don't know where the speed is going to come from in this race. I mean, is CZ Rocket going to try to be aggressive out of there? Hartwood potentially uh, as a pace factor. Where does the real confirmed speed come from? I mean, does Limousine Liberal try to go a little bit from the fence, or is just City of Light that much faster than these? But cutting back from that distance, I don't know if I would expect this horse 
to flash the same type of speed that he showed when he was sprinting. Um, that being said, I, I, I'm just by default, I'm going to go with Whitmore and just hope that he can get enough pace to set things up for him. I love the run against Imperial Hintu back in the true north. I mean, or may have been best that day. Um, and I mean, we saw, we all saw what Imperial Hint come back, came back to do the next start against limousine liberal kind of a funny run race, but I think this horse just needs that same trip as two back where he can just lay back, make one run. I wish there was going to be a 21 up there on the board, but I'm going to pick bit more anyway. <laughs> Sean, what do you think? Man, I tell you on paper, I just don't know how to you like it. See, um, I know cutting back, maybe he won't show as much speed, but you look at that work pattern that he's had since that last race and he's fired five straight bullets. So, I mean, I think he's getting the speed put right back into him. He's got the absolute perfect draw on the outside. Um, I mean, he looks like he just lays over this field, which I believe is a good, good field without Imperial hint in here. There's still plenty of depth. Um, the horse, the only horse I would try to beat him with, uh, is, is our good friend Ben Colebrook's horse, Limousine Liberal, with that salty old uh, veteran who's six years old. He's been on the board the last 11 starts. Get Jose Ortiz, who, who seems to fit this horse extremely well. Um, you know, I've seen this horse train, you know, throughout the summertime, and, and it's just one of those good, hard-knocking horses that he's going to show up every single time and lay it out. He's, he runs very well at Saratoga. The, the King's Bishop, where he ran second behind, run happy, doesn't even show up on this form anymore. But um, for me, it, it, I think it's all about City of Light, but if he happens to, to not show up with his A game, uh, I think Limousine Liberal is the only horse that I, I could use to, to beat him in here. Let's go. But Sean, you see, Sean you, see, you see City of Light being the speed of the speed in this race? You know, I think if if there's not that real honest opening uh, quarter, you know, I, I could see him being being plenty close. I could see Irad, you know, from the outside, he can he's going to be able to dictate whatever he wants to do. I think if he breaks sharp enough, and and he's either going to just lay off maybe Hartwood who who sets the pace, but but I don't, you know, he's not the class and quality here. Um, you know, maybe CZ Rock with Bridge Mahan wants to maybe try to show a little bit more speed, but then after that. It, and then, you know, losing liberal maybe from the rail, but I think he's going to gonna want to break and maybe just move off the rail a little bit and try to get in that 3-4 path if he can. But, you know, I think City Light with his post and, and with the way he's training, I think it's, you know, he, he gets the perfect ability to, to do whatever he wants, whether he wants to go or, or sit off a, a horse set in kind of a, an honest pace. But it's a, I, it's I a don't great, get it. it. It's a great point about the options that you have when you're potentially the best speed, but you're also the outside speed. And a horse like that who's shown the ability to stalk and pounce as well, it's, it's got to be a, a little bit of an advantage. Are you skeptical about the race setup for City of Life Pipes, or, or do, you, do you buy what we're no, saying? No, I mean, I think not. I mean, I think that the horse got a great draw. Like, I agree with everything that Sean said. I think he'll be able to dictate what he wants to do from out there, whether he wants to stalk or if there's not a blazing opening for action and he can take control of things early. I think everything sets up for him with a post-position draw. Um, you know, I was just wondering where, where my man Luch is when I need him to stick in a rabbit in this race to go 21. Uh, but you know, you know, man, I, no, I agree with what Sean said. I, I think he, that the horse is going to take a lot of beating. Uh, I am going to try to do so with Whitmore. It's, I was looking, you know, looking through this race, it's interesting because I just think back on like, you know, if you were to ask me back on Derby weekend, if we were going to run this race after after a race like the Churchill Downs race, uh, I would have definitely wanted Awesome Slew. I have always liked him. I thought he's a quality horse that always showed up. He was running against the hardest knocking horses last year. Comes back with a performance that runs second behind Army Mule, who looked like he could have been, you know, the fastest horse on the planet. Um, and then the, after the last two races, it's like, now I just don't want any part of him. And I'm kind of like, you know, I'm just sitting here, you know, wondering like, you know, how he went south so quick, but, uh, you know, maybe he'll show up and surprise me. What's, what's the old line, you know, horses, uh, like strawberries, they can go bad overnight. I mean, it ha form reversals happen. The only thing I'll say in defense of awesome slew is the fact that they chose the spot they did to bring him back. Um, if he was. If he was like meant to run a big race, I don't think they would have chosen that spot. And having apparently worked well since, it just makes me wonder if he wasn't 
just really short that day, and you couldn't see much better from him. But I still think with as much as I like uh, City of Light and respect the class of Limousine Liberal and also the form and -and up-and-coming nature of a horse like CZ Rocket, uh, my gut was I'd use Awesome Slew, but more for more for underneath. But let's hear what our man, Jonathan Kitchen, has to say about this year's for go. Let's see. What horse did Pipes pick in this one? He probably picked, uh, seems like a, he seems like a no-dozing type. Mm, no, he's on Limousine Liberal off of that trip. Look, I like Limousine Liberal. Uh, the horse has been really good to me in my life. He's always shows up. He's game as ever. His Belmont sprint is the definition of game racehorse, the way that he ran in that spot, stuck in behind, and uh, he really came running. Uh, look, I, I just think that the draw, the pace advantage, the ability to run seven furlongs, I love City of Light in this spot. Uh, we talk about Mike McCarthy on the show all the time about I think he's one of the most underappreciated trainers in North America. He shifts this horse out to the east coast we talk about those west coast dirt horses coming out east and and the ability that they have to run so well is the same as when the east coast trainers send a turf horse out west i think city of light is going to be tough drawn outside he gets the meets leading rider in irad ortiz uh, his two seven furlong races uh the great ones that he's won the triple bend and the malibu were extremely impressive the mile and a quarter experiment didn't quite work Cutting back now, for all accounts, he's been training really well. I think City of Light's going to be extremely tough on the outside. I'm going to single there. If you're going to go deeper in this spot, you got to use a lot of horses. you got to use No Dozing. you got to use Whitmore. you got to use Austin Slew, Limousine Liberal. I'm going to take a stand in this spot, and I'm going to single City of Light. All right, that was my guess as to J.K.'s move, given his affinity for City of Light and, and just the form and all the, the, the case that uh, the, the crew has been making throughout. Just before we move on, we've got three more stakes races left to talk about. We're going to get to the Sword Dancer next. I just wanted to go ahead and recap so- how the the betting sequences are going to work from our friends at Naira on this card. The first race we talked about today was the Jerkins, which goes as race six. That one is where the pick six begins. That means that there will be uh, a Naira bets pick five that starts on race seven, the personal ensign. And it also critically means that the last of these stakes races we're going to talk about, the Boston spot, is not included in those. So in terms of the pick five and pick six, these next two races we're going to talk about, close them out. But then they'll also be, starting on this race, the Sword Dancer, we're about to talk about an all-stakes pick three that begins here. So a little bit different. There is a walkout race. There is a 13th race, a maiden 40. We're not going to be talking about. Be aware of that as well. But, you know, you're going to want to look very closely at your daily racing form and make sure you get correct in your head where the picks are for Travers Day. A little bit different. Um, Going to be huge pools and great opportunities. Also, and I know Pipes is interested in this, the Grand Slam. And if we have time, we're going to talk about the Grand Slam before the end of the show. Uh, Because I know Pipe's very proficient at it. That one starts in the forego, the race we just discussed. But let's go ahead and move on to the Sword Dancer. Pipe's, I'm going to send it back to you for your thoughts. Uh, I'm coming right back to Old Faithful in here, man. Sadler's Joy. I love this horse, man. I've I've been on this horse for a long time. He seems to burn a a lot of my money, but he's also made me a couple uh, couple good scores as well. Um, You know, I think last time, I mean, the horse will just run on anything. I mean, he'll, he'll run on broken glass, this horse. But I think three turns, obviously, much better for this horse. Uh, this is going to be right up this horse's alley. I like the outside draw. You got, a, you got a lot of speed inside to set it up with Glorious Empire. Fantastic and high happy. Should all be out there to set a decent enough clip. I thought they walked last time on soft ground. This horse only blew a half length with kind of you know, in between running room in the lane. And I just think that if this horse gets an outside run with a little bit of pace set up on firm ground, three turns, uh, I mean, I just love this horse. I know he runs about the same race every time, but I, uh, I just think that he's, that he's better than these with a fair pace in front. Let me ask you this pipes, this horse Sadler's joy. One of the reasons uh, you were able to hit the pick six on Travers day last year and in that wild and desperate finish, did you need him to get up, or did you have anything with uh, with the horse who ran uh, 
who ran second that day. I did not. I did not. I did not use money multiplier or bigger picture. I needed him to get up, or I was dead meat. <laughs> so yeah, there may, maybe maybe just a hint of loyalty too coming from your corner with the Sadler's but, Joy pick. Of, of course, but you know something, LP. This this horse. If you if you look back and you go through the not only the running lines but you go back and watch the replays, man, this is a horse that you need to time it just right with, man. It's either you're you're gonna get there or you're or you're gonna fall just short. But he he, he can't make the lead too early. He makes the lead too early. We all know what happens. We talked about it last year on the show. You gotta time it just right. But I do think that with enough pace in front and an outside run, I think that he can time it just right. And Javier's had two chances with his horse just missed on both. I thought the Manhattan, the horse ran giant. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm coming back. I'm sticking with Old Faithful. I'm give a shout-out to my man, John Panago. Let's get it done this time, kid. <laughs> I like it. Um, that's a really interesting handicapping angle that I think people probably don't consider that often. The idea that a certain rider – partnering with a horse multiple times might have a little bit of an advantage. That idea, hey, now he knows the horse, he's going to know how to ride him, especially a horse like Sadler's Joy, who I think it's pretty obvious if you watch the replays, can be a tricky ride at times. Is that an angle unique to Sadler's Joy for you, Pipes, or is that something you see time and time again with uh, riders getting back on horses who might be tricky rides? No, I mean, you know, I, I do. I, I love that angle. I use that a lot in my handicapping man where riders just seem to fit or get along with certain horses better. And when I watch them run in a, in a maiden special weight and they just seem to fit, a, you know, a certain horse so well, and then maybe they're off that horse for three or four straight times. But when they show back up, I like to come back when they get reacquainted. That's definitely an angle that I use. The old wind rider angle I, I remember uh, reading about in handicapping books in, in from days of yore and pipes pointing out a reason why that might uh, work as effectively as it does. Sean Tugel, your thoughts on this year's sword dancer? Um, I mean, there's several different ways I think you'd go. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with pipes here. Taylor's Joy is a horse that I always tend to land on. He's one that uh, makes you hold your breath for about at least a quarter mile every single time he runs. Um, and, and for the main reason, which I, I agree upon, uh, is Castellano. I know a lot after the, uh, the Belmont ride, you, you saw in publications that, that, you know, he, he did make his move a little early and that, and you know, that was his first time on him. And then, you know, that I, that last race, I mean, I can't believe any of them got there. We, we were actually, that was Haskell weekend and we were down there, uh, at Monmouth watching, watching pick five and we didn't have glorious empire, but we had channel maker and. Sadler's Joy. So I remember how slow that that was. I think there will be a little bit more pace here. Uh, both Spring Quality and Fantastic are two horses that I want to like, you know. But I think uh, they're on the, uh, the 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 negative side of, of winning a big race because they both won Grade One last time out and and went from from getting weight breaks to now being high weight. So I think that's kind of an angle to use against them. Uh, so Sadler's Joy for me, I'm going to land there. Um, Hopefully he gets the pace to run at Castellano third time on. I mean, if, if so he should know the horse to the point now where he knows where to hit go. And, and uh, so I, I'm going to go with Sadler's joy, but, but there's four or five other ways I'm going to have to spread here for that. That's for sure. Well, lots of agreement. Once again, let's see if Jonathan Kinchin makes it three for three in our discussion of this year's sword dancer. Really tough turf race here, and you know, a wide open situation. Not a lot of pace in here. I guess most people are going to assume that Glorious Empire, who who found the lead for the first time in his last what six or seven starts, is going to be on the front end again, drawn down on the inside. The difference here is, I think people now know that the horse could get brave if they let him go. I think they'll stay connected to this horse. High happy on a firmer surface should be closer to that one. Put a little bit of pressure on him. I'm going to use three horses in the multi race bets, and, and and I'll and I'll land on my final choice here in a second. I'm I'm going to use the six bigger picture, the seven channel maker. Both of those horses were closing into the slow paced bowling green. Uh, both, uh, you know, definitely weren't helped by those trips and by the pace in that situation. And then the trusty old 10 horse Sadler's Joy. Um, look, that horse is, is, was give us one of the most thrilling runs uh, and also a great, uh, a great uh, gif, if, if you know what I mean, by a performance he had here at Saratoga in this race last year. I think Sadler's Joy is going to be extremely tough with, with 
you know, these races where they allow these closers into the races, which I think is going to happen here, you want to find the one that has the quickest turn of foot, the ability to kind of stay in that final three eights to be able to kind of unleash a, a furious run. And I think that Sadler's Joy is, is one of those. And so for that reason, uh, Sadler's Joy is never going to be a single, a single uh, bull horse, a single uh, bull horse. You can uh, add that to the dictionary. He is definitely a horse that you always have to use. My top pick here is going to be the horse that uh, that uh, for for a trainer that you could put me, Tugel, Pipes, and Pete in a horse suit, and he can get us to run a mile and a half on the grass. And that's Mike Major in bigger picture. I think this horse is going to run big in this spot, a little bit of extra ground to close into, and uh, hopefully a little bit of a better pace scenario. At least he gets invited into the race a little bit earlier. There you have J.K. Uh, chiming in on this year's Sword Dancer. No surprise in a in a long turf race, he picks Mike Maker. Um, bigger picture, appealing eight to one on the morning line. For me, it's a spread race, and the the gang has definitely gotten me. I, I was thinking of certainly using Sadler's Joy, but maybe trying to be a little against. The group has basically convinced me that I probably need to upgrade Sadler's Joy to to an A in this situation. Any other thoughts from the crew on? the sword dancer before we, we move well, on to the main event. I, I've, I've got one question. You may be able to answer this cause, cause you're on site, but uh, I know with the recent weather and how wet the turf course has been. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you expect this turf course? Will they have the rail all the way down? They've had the rail out for a long time. It's on the inner turf. What, how do, how do you see with, with an over the last week, a lot of turf races not being on the turf and the turf being unused. Um, do you think it's going to be played any differently than it has, throughout the meet or, or do you, are you going to use that at all when, when looking at any of these horses? I think it's always a good idea to consider um, on a big day, especially when we've seen them drop the rails on a big day and all of a sudden it doesn't necessarily favor speed or closers, but sometimes those inside paths do seem a little bit more favorable. I've been taking, I've been having a little bit of a mini vacation this week. I've been watching the races, but not betting as much. It does seem like the inside has been, um, at least fair, if not a little bit better than it's been throughout the meet. Pipes, you're an observant guy. What have you noticed about how the turf's been playing this week, and how do you yeah. expect it to play tomorrow? I mean, the inside pass, the inside pass seem seem like they're you know seem to be the better the better ground as opposed to obviously up here when it was when it was you know we were dealing with the bog for most of the month. Uh, Any time that the races stayed off, you wanted to come down the outside pass. The inside was was death. But now, you know, with the rails down, of course, you're going to see the inside pass be better. We haven't had rain all week. The ground should be good to go, and we should see a quicker pace in a race like that because of that, uh, all those factors. But, you know, in, in that type of a setup, I'm really not worried about it in a mile-and-a-half race. I would be more uh, – you know, I would be more worried about just what type of confirmed speed is signed on because, like J.K. said, when you get some of these horses are left alone up front, they're classy enough to get brave. Uh, you know, I don't think the ground is going to be as big of a factor as you think. You did say something earlier, Pipes, that I wanted to just loop back to. You actually thought that the outside draw for Sadler's Joy was a good thing. I saw it as, you know, neutral at best and potentially negative in terms of maybe having to go – three or four wide around the first turn, depending on where, where he ended up and how the horses inside of him broke. Why do you think the outside is actively a good thing? I guess for, for a horse like, for a horse like him, I just think he's going to drop in anyway. So be last, no matter what, let him be, let, let him be, let him be, let him be clear with nobody, with nobody out there when he, when he breaks and just let him drop over and do what he wants to do, as opposed to being in a situation where he could be, you know, in the three or the four hole, break a little slow, get squeezed or have somebody come over on him. I just, I don't, ha- I don't have a problem with him being out there. I think it's a real good spot. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the main event. The Travers fascinating handicapping puzzle this time around pipes. I'm going to keep it with you. Who is going to pay off these pick fives and pick sixes uh, for our friends at the New York Race- racing association in this year's Travers stakes. You know, man, we've been picking a, uh, We've been picking a lot of chalk on this show so far. I think it's time to light up the toe with a 15 to one shot like King Zachary. Nice. Uh, you know what? I, I love this horse and the, it, it, you know, the way that the horse ran in the Matt win. I was looking for the horse to have a huge summer campaign. After I saw that Matt win automatically intrigued me for this horse's prospects of the Travers. I know the Indiana Derby, 
was an average, you know, par looking performance. But I think that the horse came back with a strong work that Indiana track can play funny. You know, there should be some, some hitting up here, a mile and a quarter curling out of a giant's causeway mare. The distance shouldn't be a problem. And I'm going to take a big shot and hope that Alvarado can get some pace and cut them all down late. There have been some positive backstretch whispers about this horse, two pipes, and he was certainly one I had on the on the target for maybe including underneath. But you think he can win the whole thing, huh? I do. You know what, man? I look, good magic's most likely winner. Should lay close, can position himself forwardly, even if the pace is hot and prove that he can still finish. His Haskell, I have no knocks against. I thought it was a great performance, but to me at a, at a very short price, uh, you know, in a race where I'm, where I'm probably, you know, not looking to bet anybody on the nose. I'm looking to see if I can get creative here and get a, and get somebody home. That's going to pay, that's going to pay out a ticket, you know, Sean, before I ask you to put your horse player hat on to discuss this year's Travers, I want to talk about the Windstar horse in this race, the six Meistermind. Um, how was how you were you involved in the decision to put the horse in this spot, and and uh, what w- went into that thought process? Well, it, it, I was involved a little bit. Obviously, I don't get to make make the decisions, but I got a little bit of a. Uh, I was able to put in my my two cents. Put it that way. Um, you know, it's a horse that uh, he's got the pedigree. He's a half to a Kentucky Derby winner. He's a half to Dullahan, who is a mile and a quarter winner. Um, he broke his maiden at Churchill, going away at a mile and a quarter. Um, my biggest push was, if you look at his last race, he was running against older. He drew the rail. He, um, it was a muddy track. I don't think it was to his liking. But if you watch the last about 100, 150 yards, um, Santana really, he, he kind of wrapped up on him a little bit and, and kind of was a back in between a, a wall of horses and really didn't have anywhere to go. He's only beaten about three quarters of the length per second. Uh, the winner got a clear trip. And then if you watch the gallop out, he galloped out past everyone once he, once he was able to get through that hole. And he did that, all that on, on by himself. Um, he got a jockey change to Manny Franco, who's a great young rider. Um, it's a, it's a lot to ask of this horse to run here, but, um, there's, he, there's a lot of positives that we know with this horse is the pedigrees there, uh, the connections are there, and and you absolutely 100% know that he's going to get the mile and a quarter, which is a big question mark for a lot of other three-year-olds in this race. Um, so that's why we're we're taking this this big chance. But uh, the horse is doing great. Uh, if you go on XB TV there about two weeks ago, he worked a tenfold and worked heads up with him. Looked fantastic at Saratoga Train Track. Uh, he's done well since he's been up there, and mentally he's really come around since since his two year old year. So he's going the right way. We're gonna have to ask him to run his lifetime race, but um, uh, there's some things that at least we can take out of the equation uh, that give us the uh, positive feeling to take this chance. Makes sense to me. Let me ask you this: You hear a lot of times, obviously, in the breeding side of the business about fillies and mares and how important it is for them to have uh, close-up finishes or underneath finishes, black-type finishes. For a horse like Meistermind, does a close-up, does does a second or third mean anything to horses like this future value, or is it a is it a really a win or bust when you're dealing with males? Um, well, we own the mare, and um, and so we have some some, some daughters and, and some, some other colts that we're going to sell out of her, so... It's always great to pad the pedigree, although there's already a derby winner in there. Um, she's a fantastic mare that we own in partnership with the Needhams. Um, so regardless of whether it's a filly or a colt, uh, it's going to help the family that we have here on the farm. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we, we stand the, the horse Bodie Meister, who's already has a, a derby winner at a mile and a quarter and always dreaming. Um, so, you know, we're, we'd like to try to help out the stallion as well, who's who's gotten off to a fantastic career and second crop sire. So, um, you know, that's, that's the thing is, is, uh, there's a lot of positives here. If this horse wins or even gets up and is, is uh, competitive, but, um, he's doing well and he deserves a chance to run. So we're hoping, hoping he runs a big one. That's great insight into the way that you think about things on the breeding side of the business that I think many horse players wouldn't even necessarily occur to them. Now put your horse player hat on, uh, uh, Sean, where, where are your, you know, outside of your, putting your horse aside, what is your view on this year's Travers? Well, 
I, I've got pure horse handicapping, and then I have history to kind of go back on. And and for me, I'm going to try to beat good magic here. It's you know over over the over the years that going from the Haskell to the Travers has been a very difficult task to ask of, of horses, and it hasn't been always the the most positive move. So in that form, I'm going to try to beat the horse. Uh, which I think he he could go off, you know, six to five. I don't think he goes off even money by any means, but but he definitely would be heavy favorite. I'm going to draw a line through the Jim Dandy race. I just wasn't impressed by that race. Uh, the number came, but you know, Hoffberg the day before ran a hundred buyer. The winner of the Jim Dandy came back and ran a 94. It's kind of blanket finish. Vino Rosso kind of came running late, which he likes to do every once in a while. So that's not necessary. I'm going to try to use that as a race to 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 use against. I keep falling on. Uh, on about two horses, and, and I really think the filly's doing as good as any horse in the race. Um, she's proven over the distance. She gets the weight break, uh, leading jock on her, bullet work last time out. I'm all over the filly, uh, but I'm also with Pice on King Zachary. He's a horse that I was at the Matt win, and it was like uh, a wow performance. Like, who was that? Uh, and he's shown a lot of talent throughout the spring, had a little bit of, of unlucky races. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but during during the the post position draw, uh, Romans attributed his Indiana Derby to bleeding. So he never bled in his life, but he bled in that race, and that's why he didn't run well. And ever since he's gotten to Saratoga, you can see that work pattern and that cool air up there has him doing well. Um, so if he can, you know, return to that Matt Wynn performance, he's by Curlin out of Giants Causeway Mare. He'll have every ability to get the distance. I think the pace scenario probably sets up well for him. Um, so I'm going to go – Wonder Godot with King Zachary and see my mind rolling down the lane. <laughs> I like it. Hey, I want to touch base on a couple other horses in here just while we got some time. Yeah. Uh, number one, let's talk about this uh, this Catholic boy, if we can, for a minute. Because I like Catholic he's a, he's a horse that's interesting to me. I just think, you know, to be honest with you, I do think that he's, that he's probably a better turf horse, but he has proved the ability to handle dirt. And what I know about this horse is that he's a tiger, man. I mean, he's, this horse is a game. He's his game of horses. They come, I, you know, I think that obviously it's going to do tremendous for this horse's value if he can be a grade one winner on dual surfaces. And I understand probably why they're taking the shot, but I don't think that that's the only reason. And I think that, you know, this kid's a sharp young kid, this Jonathan Thomas. He's a really good trainer. He's got this horse going great guns. And this horse is going to be on my tickets. I mean, I'm not throwing out. I'm not throwing Catholic boy out. Gronkowski, I didn't know which way to go. I kind of think that the rider is going to suit the horse well with that type of a style. And, I mean, if Chad had the horse off of the Belmont pointing for this spot, uh, you know, he, obviously he's going to be very dangerous as well. But I just wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on those two horses. I have them both as A's. They'd be my, they'd be my first and, uh, and second choice in the race, honestly, Pipes. I think you made all the points about Catholic Boy. I think if you look at the numbers, he was running on dirt in the past, and you project improvement for maturity – that's going to put him right there. And I think if you just look at the numbers and, and uh, the way that the, the talent, basically, that Gronkowski flashed last time, he's not one that I want to get beat. And I think because of good Magic's presence, you're going to get a, a somewhat square price, uh, even if he's a little shorter than the 4-1 to one of the morning line because he's the famous horse with the, with the flashy name. He's not one I want to lose to. Sean, your thoughts on those two contenders, and then we'll throw it to J.K. Yeah, you know, Catholic boy – um, he obviously, I, I think he's fast enough. Um, I think he'll be part of the early speed. Um, you know, whether that, but you know, the, is he truly a dirt horse? He's, that's the question he's going to have to answer for me. Um, you know, those, those horses that, that are high class horses like himself, they'll, they might be able to get you a mile 16th, mile and eighth on the dirt, but is he going to get the mile and a quarter on the dirt the same way he can get a mile and a quarter on the, on the turf? That's a big question for me. Um, Gronkowski, I really want to, I really want to like, like he's kind of right there where I could definitely use him. I thought his Belmont was, was very good. Um, but I just, you know, there's something about him that I, he, maybe he just hasn't sold himself yet and he could very easily sell himself here this weekend. Uh, it looks like he's been working well. Um, I just, you know, sometimes you just got to take a stand and, 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 uh, I'm kind of going against him. I think maybe he's, he might be just too far back, but uh, 
But I think uh, the one horse trigger warning, that's the one that, that interests me, how fast he's going to set that opening quarter. All right, let's throw, let's bring our friend Jonathan Kitchen. It turns out I just got a text from JK. Not only is he appearing on this pod, but now he's gotten himself in a position to listen. Let's give JK the ultimate throw of listening to himself and his view on this year's Travers. An extremely tough edition of the Travers. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use five horses in multi-race bets, um, and, and, and my pick might surprise uh, surprise you guys on where I actually land. I'm going to use Gronkowski, obviously. Uh, the race that he ran in the Belmont was impressive from all accounts. He's working really well and, and, and should be tough in, in, in moving forward. If he can get a little bit of pace to run into, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that he won't won't get that pace. Uh, King Zachary with the, with the big race and the Matt win with a nice figure. Uh, obviously didn't run as well in Indiana as he did at Churchill, but uh, Dale Romans doesn't need to let anyone know that he knows how to win a Travers. Uh, sorry about that, Pete. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm still mad at you, Elliot. Uh, the eight, Mendelssohn, more on him in a second. The nine, Good Magic, obviously uh, the most likely winner of the day. The horse ran huge in the Haskell. He's the most talented horse I think we have uh, in, in the three-year-old division at this point. However, uh, the Haskell and the, the, the Travers situation has been tough for, for various reasons, but it's been tough, and, and so we'll see what happens with Good Magic. And I think Catholic Boy is just a gutsy type. We talked about him and his races against Analyze It. I think that Catholic Boy is the epitome of a, of a tough and, and gutsy racehorse. I think that he could be live in that spot. But my pick is Mendelssohn. Look, I understand that the rail was really good. Um, it made on, and I think we all are aware of that. However... I think that this is the first time this horse is actually going to get a chance to run on a fast track at a mile and a quarter with a favorable pace scenario where he's not going to be run off of his feet. And I just think that he, he's, you know, he's drawn outside. He should get a good position in the clear and uh, have the chance to really show if he's good enough. I, I trust Aiden O'Brien wouldn't continuously bang his head against the wall with this horse if he didn't feel like there was excuses for why he hasn't handled the dirt thus far in America. And, and one of the reasons I think is that the kind of sharp one turn mile at Belmont, I think, is going to was part of the issue. And I, I think that this horse is going to run much better here. Like I said, he's not my top, you know, I'm going to single him on the day, but he is the he is the horse that I'm going to give on the show and uh, in a race where I'm going to be spreading. And so uh, we'll see what happens. Very bold stuff from J.K. I'd sort of resigned myself to including Mendelssohn, if only because I think in some quarters, the hate on the horse has gone too far and he'll be a huge price and he has flashed that talent. But for JK to go out and put him on, put him right on top. That's some bold stuff. Sean, what, give us your perspective. This horse from a breeding point of view, so incredibly valuable already on this pedigree. Uh, do you think he has a chance here? And what do you think about him in his career going forward? Um, I, I, I think they're just taking a stab at it here. Um, I mean, the Derby was a disaster. You know, there was an excuse there, but for me, I mean, where's the, where's your excuse? Um, in, in the Dwyer, he, he was up close same way. He won the, the, the Maydan race. Um, I think they're trying to pot, you know, if they can win this, he'd be an unbelievable standing prospect. He's already a breeders cup winner. He's a half to one of the most influential young sires, um, in, in the stud book right now. I think they're just trying to take a swing. I don't see them having any chance here, and, and I can't use them. Pipes, any more optimism? Which 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 side of this coin do you fall on? I I give I give Mendelssohn zero chance in this race. I I not a I'm not a Mendelssohn fan. I I mean I like I'm gonna you know say everything that Google just said in terms of from a breeding standpoint. Obviously, he knows you know that well. Um, you know, about why they would want to take the shot, but I, I don't know. I don't give him a shot. I'm, I'm against, I'm against two horses in the Travers. If Wander Godot or Mendelssohn wins, you'll be seeing me walk out with my head hung low. <laughs> I've seen that once or twice, but hopefully not tomorrow. We, we should, I should probably let you and Sean fight it out, but we're running. We got the approval to go five minutes over. Matt Bernier has uh, rubber stamped it. Producer Craig has rubber stamped it, but I want to use those five minutes rather than fighting about Wonder Godot to talk quickly about the Boston Spa. And then uh, I did want to ask Sean about the wild ride this year with Justify. So we're going to spend the last five minutes on those two things. We'll start it off with the Boston Spa. Pipes, who'd you come up with in here? I got Proctor's Ledge, man. 
Johnny V getting back aboard. I thought watching the last race, man, and the Diane, I thought Jose was following uh, a raving beauty and encountered trouble into the turn. The raving beauty got checked back, forced Jose to check. Uh, he had to kind of wait in the stretch when a raving beauty got going again. He couldn't follow that horse. He had to wait. He was almost blind switched by sister Charlie pinned in past the eighth pole. And then obviously she just didn't finish out, uh, the way she was capable of finishing because of the trouble that she encountered. She loves it up here. She's been great over this turf course at Saratoga. I throw out the last race. I love the two times that she ran before with Johnny V aboard against a raving beauty. I thought she was pinned in, never stopped fighting at Belmont at a flat mile. I think she's better at two turns. I'm going to hope with Johnny V getting back aboard, we can get a sweeter trip because we're going to need every inch to get by this Arabian beauty, who I think is a really, really good horse, but I'm going to go three, one in there. You think the trips could make the difference and you'll to close out your grand slam, you'll use both or you'll only go Proctor. I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to use both. I'm going to use both in the grand slam, but I'll have a bigger one with Proctor's ledge. Uh, just to, I've always really been a big fan of this Philly. I think she's, she's just a great horse. And, uh, Johnny V both times that he's been a boarder. I thought the race at Churchill was flawless. I thought the ride at Belmont was flawless. And I'm glad that, uh, that Brennan's getting him back aboard, uh, at her favorite course. Makes sense to me. Sean, how did you see this one? Well, I, I'm as well a, a big fan of Rogers ledge for some time. Uh, Brennan Walsh, great, great young trainer. She loves Saratoga. Uh, had definitely had to do a double take when I saw Indian blessing back in the entry box. But um, I am two hands, all two fists, all the way in. Maybe the only bet I make all day on Kidura. Love that she had a beautiful setup race. She's been breathing well. Good figure, first time Chad Brown. Coming back second time. She's run well over the course. I, I'm all over Kidura. Love her. Interesting, interesting. You see, how do you see it playing out for Kidura uh, trip-wise? You know, I think, uh, I, I don't think there's, I'm going to say there's not a huge amount of pace. I think Hawksmoor uh, hasn't really come back to the, the, the really good Hawksmoor that we kind of saw a little bit last, you know, late 17. Uh, I think Hawksmoor and Kadura. Kadura sits right off her hip. Hawksmoor just gives her the perfect trip. She kicks for home, and the other Chad Browns can't catch it. It's a bold prediction. Let's see what Jonathan Kitchen has to say. The Boston Spa, unfortunately, are the big mare isn't going to be running in this spot like last year. I'm sure Pipes is smiling ear to ear talking about Lady Eli. Look, the Piper and I have a lot of things in common. All right? we, we enjoy a lot of things, uh, a nice pair of shoes, uh, a fresh haircut. We always are on the wrong chat. I, I'm on one chat. He's on the other one. Sometimes I'm right more often than not he is in that category. I love a raving beauty. If he picked a raving beauty, she can't lose, but he probably picked off limits or Kadera. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. I think they're both live as well. But I think Raving Beauty is, is, is something special. I think she could be really, really tough to deal with in this spot. Let's hope JK's predictions about which horses win tomorrow are better than his predictions about who on the panel was going to pick tomorrow because I don't think he got one right. But uh, he, <laughs> surprise, surprise, he goes for the heavy chalk of Raving Beauty, who I think we can all agree, uh, extremely likely winner in the spot. But I like that we have a couple of divergent ways to go to close out uh, the various wagers that are going to pay off with the Boston spot tomorrow. I've got one more question for each of you. Pipes, I'm going to give you a chance to think about yours. You gave us your horses in the payoff leg of the Grand Slam. I want a horse from you. I'm going to come back to you for, for what the, the first part of your Grand Slam ticket is going to look like, how you're going to load the bases before you knock it out of the park with Proctor's Ledge or a Raving Beauty tomorrow. But in the meantime, Sean, I, I can't let you out of here without talking a little bit about Justify and uh, what's been up since his racing days were over and, and uh, how the horse has been adjusting to his, his new life uh, and, and, and just a little bit of reflection on being part of this wild ride with Justify throughout uh, 2018. Well, it was, uh, it was certainly one that, uh, you know, you hope, you, out, you hope when you get into this business that uh, you get a chance to, to be part of something like that. And uh, obviously at Windstar, it's, it's a great team that, that's uh, been able to put together a ride like this, you know, from the time that we broke them on the farm, 
The horse went through many of the, the team's hands and, and then got into uh, Rudolph's hands at Keeneland, and he got into Bob Baffer. And obviously, in 111 days from the time he broke his mane to the time he was a Triple Crown winner, it was an unbelievable ride. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, get a chance to, to be on something even closely similar to that. But, uh, you know, to be around a horse like that, it's, it's honestly a once in a lifetime opportunity and a great opportunity that that uh, Mr. Trout and, and Elliot were, were able to allow everybody to be part of. Um, so but he fell in really well here since, uh, since he was retired. Um, still has a little bit more of, of life he's going to find out about, about being a breeding stallion. So uh, that's to come in, in the next couple months. But, uh, you know, we, we've got tours here six days, five, six days a week uh, through horse country that, that any fan can sign up for and, and have the opportunity to come out and see them. Um, so we have, we're, that's available, uh, I believe it's like 11.30 and 1.30, um, you know, five or six days a week. Uh, you can go to horsecountrytours.com and uh, have your opportunity to come out and see him at the farm. Um, so it was just a remarkable ride that, uh, you know, everybody's going to have their stories about where they were when he won this race and that race. And uh, so uh, those are lifetime memories. And I can say I've been in, uh, in all three win photos for the Triple Crown. Wow, <laughs> that's great stuff. I still think, you know, Sean, I still think I should get extra credit for that good luck round I bought you lot at uh, Peter Luger the night before the Belmont. I, I, I still, I think that, I think, I think I might have to get my sneak myself on one of those tours as a, as a thank you for that. I, 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 I believe that uh, you know that the door is always open for you when you're in Lexington. Excellent. Can't wait to get back out there. All right, pipes. We, we're over time, but I do want – I know you are the king of the Grand Slam. I'm going to be playing whatever Grand Slam ticket you give out. I'm playing tomorrow. Who are we using in the 9th, 10th, and 11th? Let's do it, man. Here we go. We're starting with we're starting with the four goal. We're going to use Whitmore. We'll hope that he's good enough to win, but he always comes with his late run, so let's hope he can at least pick up enough pieces to hit the board. In the, in the uh, sword dancer, we're obviously going to use Sadler's Joy. I think he's very logical to hit the board. Unfortunately, he's probably going to go favored, so I'm going to have to chalk out in that leg. And in the Travers, I'm going to go three deep. Let's go Gronkowski. King Zachary and Catholic boy, and hopefully we can get good magic or Wander Godot off the board, and we'll close it out with a raving beauty and Proctor's Ledge for all the dull. I like it. The Grand Slam innovative wager from our friends at the New York Racing Association. One a horse to be on the board in the first three legs. Close it out with the winner of the fourth leg. One of the many things you should be having a look at on this Saturday card, in addition to the pick six, the pick five, uh, extra pick fours, check out the wagering menu, get involved, get yourself to Saratoga, projects to be a phenomenal day. I want to thank my guests, Sean Tugel and Chris Pipito, the Piper, for uh, for making it here today. I'll give less thanks, but still a little thanks to the usual co-host, Jonathan Kinchin, enjoying a, a Pims and Lemonade over there in the UK. I want to thank producer Craig. We made him work extra hard today. As always, Willie Nile and Travis Stone for providing our intro. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for listening. Also, special shout out, of course, to our sponsor, our friends at Naira, the New York Racing Association. I'll be there on the second floor of the grandstand tomorrow at 11 o'clock, right before the first race. Um, chatting away with Nick Tamaro and Mike Watchmaker going over our thoughts also on this Travers Day card. In any case, we will be back on Tuesday. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. May you win all your Travers Day photos. <laughs>